talk today about death. Uh, what happens, at least from a hermetic perspective, what happens when one dies? What is death? Uh, what is the process? And probably say something a little bit about uh, the process of grieving as well, because um, that's the other part of death. Um, sort of two separate things here. The death itself, what happens, the process, and our reaction when someone dies. Um, so, um, <clears throat> we have a mental body, an astral body, and a physical body. They are conjoined together while we are alive uh, in material form. What joins basically the mental body and the physical body is the astral body. It's the, the medium of connection. It is what connects our awareness, our mental body, to our physical body, is the astral body, the sentient self. Um, <clears throat> so, when the physical body dies, we still have an astral and a mental body. So what happens is the astral mental body separates from the physical body because the physical body can't support life anymore. And so it doesn't need, the mental body doesn't need that astral connection once the physical body dies. It's only there because we have a physical form. So, the astral mental body exits the physical body. Then what happens is the astral body begins to disintegrate, to dissipate. Um, now, that's not like a, uh, a gas dissipating into the air. Uh, the astral body is not gaseous. The astral body is composed of our emotions, essentially. It is our personality, our character. So that is what disintegrates, uh, begins to disintegrate the moment we die. Um, in that moment, immediately after death, that can be so different for for each person, it's different, I'm sure. Um, it can be very confusing. Like, what the hell just happened? Confusing? Um, or it can... Uh, someone cannot even know that they have died. Because the astral body, remember, feels very much like the physical body. It feels. <clears throat> it's the sentient self. So it's still sensing the physical world around us, around our body. So quite often, the astral mental body will stay quite close to the physical body, um, or leave very gradually. See, this is breaking down of the personality it has to do with, um, well, the character that we had while being alive. Okay? So, uh, the character transformation work that we do in initiation of hermetics puts us at an advantage when it comes to our death because we have resolved a lot of those issues of the character. And that's what happens immediately after death. We begin resolving those issues without distractions. So it's immediately confronting them. And <clears throat> this is where we get the, the tales of heaven, hell, purgatory, the summer land, the afterlife, you know, all these different tales. Because it, if you, whatever you believe when you die, you are going to experience some version of that in the astral, the, 
the astral that we are in at that point, the, that part of the astral realm is the personality, is the psyche. It's your own psyche is where you are after you die. So all the stuff that's there now goes with you. And you've got to resolve it all upon death. And for some people, that's hell. It really. For some people, that's purgatory. For some people, that's heaven. For some people, that's the summer land. For some, well, you know, it just depends on what you believe. Determines, to a great extent, the experience you have immediately after death. And you have to process all that. You have to go through all that in the same way that you do with the character transformation. Well, not in the same way. The way you go through that after death is basically a dream state. Because that, that dreaming part of the psyche, it's your little quantity of the astral realm that's all yours. It's all made up of your images, of your ideas, your thoughts, your memories. All of that is where you end up. So you might meet relatives who have died. Well, yeah, because that's what you believe, so that's what you will experience. You will experience a version of them And eventually, as you process through all of the stuff, leftovers from your life, and you get through it all, you get to <clears throat> the objective reality. You briefly experience the astral realm itself, the pristine uh, astral, universal astral realm which itself is a transitory state between incarnation and excarnation. <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're incarnate and when you're not incarnate. So you are reverting to your solitary self. Just the solitary self. Or as I would say, the air and fire regions of the mental body. And ultimately, you're in the fire region of the mental body. Now, a, <clears throat> at a certain stage in one's process of incarnations, one's sequence of incarnations, when you reach this point of being in the fire region of your temporal mental body, the true solitary self or individual self, the Tiferet self, you will have an experience of your greater self. And this is where it comes, uh, <clears throat> the idea that you decide, you choose how you are going to incarnate this next time, okay? You choose a certain work, that kind of thing. That's where that imagery comes from. Uh, it, that's not really an accurate image of it, but it is how the psyche interprets what happens um, in that region of your awareness. <clears throat> but not everybody has that experience. Um, for most people, the uh, reincarnation is just automatic. There is no pause, shall we say. Um, this doesn't happen in, in, in regular physical time sense. Um, <clears throat> so then, you know, you reach that, that point of clarity at any rate, that point where you are just your solitary self, and then you descend again. The solitary self descends and 
returns. It descends and returns. It's constantly this alchemical motion of solve et coagula, solve et coagula, solve et coagula. We do this over and over again, and it, it purifies us. You know, it is literally an alchemical process of purification that lasts through untold number of lifetimes. Okay? So we return. We again, we begin to adopt an astral body. We inhabit, as human beings, we inhabit a gestating egg within a mother. That is our first contact as an incarnating being with existence is in a womb. Okay? That point where we're getting to sense again, you know, what it's like to be in uh, this body that uh, is foreign, you know, we don't really know, we don't remember how to work these muscles. They're not working quite right anyhow. And slowly, we get a little more accustomed to it. We, we receive impressions from outside of the womb, from the mother. And then, plop, <laughs> here we are. <clears throat> Fully incarnate beings again. Okay, that's the process. You know, then we live our lives, we got all this stuff going on, we develop these characters and these personalities, and then we die again. And we go through that process once again of shedding all of the astral that we've accumulated through incarnation and return to the sentient self and then descend again over and over. Over and over. It's the most common thing. Next to birth is the most common thing. <laughs> everything. Everything that has a physical form dies in some way or another. It dissipates back into its essential structure, essential physical structure. It all does. You know, some things may last millions, billions, trillions of years, but eventually they disappear. They cease to exist at a physical level. That's the nature of the physical realm. It's temporary. You know, all the forms, it's the realm of form, which is infinite and eternal, but the forms are all temporary. They always are. Every form is temporary. Nothing lasts forever except awareness. That's the one thing that lasts forever. The, that bit of the eye that is alive and everything lasts forever. It just changes forms like we change uh, underwear, you know? It's constantly changing form. That's what life does. It takes form, gives up form, takes form, gives up form, over and over and over and over. So there's nothing to be afraid of at all. Nothing to be afraid of in reality, but we are, most of us are afraid of what's in here, of our psyche. We are afraid of ourselves. And so we develop this fear of death. You know, that's aside from the loss that everybody else experiences when we die. We don't lose anything. You know, we... we lose the things that we possess in the material realm, but 
We don't lose the memories. We don't lose the love we've experienced. You know, we don't lose the things that really matter at all. We just lose the physical ephemeral things. So that's the only loss that we experience. We don't lose other people when we die because their awareness as well, you know? So when we become pure awareness, they're there with us. <laughs> we don't lose others when we die. But those of us who are still alive, we experience loss. And that causes grief. That causes sadness. That's loss, you know? That's emotional loss. The absence of a person in our lives whom we have an emotional connection with, who we depend upon in some way for some sort of emotional fulfillment, that's grief. We have a loss. Unless you don't see it that way. You know, again, it comes down to what do you believe? Personally, I know that I can still be just as close emotionally to someone who has died as I am now. In fact, in some ways, it's easier because we don't have these limitations of distance, of space, you know, of a loved one being far away and we maybe see them every few years if we see them at all. You know, we're always experiencing that form of loss, but as a, a hermetic magician, that's not a barrier to me. You know, I can be emotionally close to anyone, whether they are alive or they're dead. <laughs> it doesn't matter. In fact, there are people that I will never in this life have the chance to touch and be close to in that way that I experienced just great love for and great love with. You know, so that's never been a barrier for me. Um, I speak to all the people that have died on me. You know, uh, they're still my friends. Um, we still communicate because that's what I believe. You know, I believe in the ancestors. I believe that these are awarenesses that still exist, that have always existed, and that I can still communicate with awareness to awareness as I did when they were alive and sitting right next to me. It's not a physical connection anymore, but it's a connection where it matters to me, where it matters. So, for me, when someone dies that I'm very close to, I do feel a physical sense of loneliness. Um, but it's, it's generally very temporary for me because then I connect with them, you know, astramentally and that loneliness disappears. But it's, they're, they're, you know, I can't touch them, you know, and there's something special in that ability to touch the ones we love, and that is what we lose. And it was inevitable. You know, that's always what we're going to lose. That is always what we lose from all the people we know will at some point die. 
if it's before we die, then we lose them in that way. Um, and if we die first, then, hey, we still lose them in that way of being able to touch them. You know, it's inevitable. It, it happens. Um, you know, that I just encourage people that are feeling uh, great grief in the loss of someone to keep that in mind that they're not lost to you they're physically not here anymore but they're still with you you know when 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 a person dies part of that a uh, disintegration of the astral the personality the character pertains to the people that we have loved and so we're standing around them. We're always circling around them, worrying about them, seeing them, seeing them grieving. And oh, that tears us apart. That really does. Think of it for a moment. If you see a loved one in a great deal of emotional distress and pain, you want them to stop. <laughs> you want them to be happy. You want them to be okay. And that's the overwhelming experience upon death is concern for your loved ones. So the dead are around us for quite a while. Basically, they are around us until we're okay. And that can be Oh, for some of us that can be decades, you know? We hold people around us who have died by how we feel about them dying. You know, if we can let them go, if we can bless them and say, oh, thank you for being with me, you know, ah, have a great journey, then they can they can let go. I think the Egyptians probably understood this the best. They understood that if you create a monument to yourself that will last for thousands of years, you will quite likely have thousands of physical years of existence as an astral being. This was one of the bodies of the Egyptians. Um, the body, the, the part of you that exists by the works that you have done. preserves a part of you, an astral, a part of your astral body, your astral being, is preserved in the works that you have done for as long as they remain an influence in the world. And, you know, of course, that will end as well. <laughs> Everything ends, but that can, you know, we have examples of that lasting for tens of thousands of years. <clears throat> um, but that's a, a minor part, uh, usually, <clears throat> of one's own being. One can reincarnate and still have that remaining astral shadow of one's former self existing out there because of that physical connection with people that are physically existing. Again, the astral is just the intermediary between 
the mental and the physical. So you can be without the mental and still have a physical connection, a slight physical connection. Okay. <clears throat> what you cannot have is no physical connection and an astral existence. The astral cannot exist without physical connection. It can linger if there is no mental connection, but it will, you know, it will inevitably dissipate. <clears throat> it just takes longer. So, I don't know what more I can say on the subject. I think that's pretty much it. I hope that's uh, helped in some way. So, I'll see you again. Bye-bye.